Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of Masters of Carpentry. My name is Alex. Joining me is my co-host, Julia. What up? And my other co-host, Noel. Yo! And joining us is our very special guest, Angie. Hello! She is a resident Stephen King expert, although not really a resident since this is her first <laughs> episode, but we're still happy to have her. Thank you. She's been around the community. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> so, Angie, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and where people can find you online? Right about now, the easiest way to find me is Twitter via Phoenix Anu. I do have my blog, AngieTusa.com, but I'm kind of taking a vacation from reviewing, which is why it's strange I'm here right now. But I did <laughs> agree to do this, and I'm happy to do it. But yeah, Twitter is the easiest thing. I usually put little asides, and if I do ever start another project up again, you will hear about it there, I promise. And as someone who's been following her projects for a long time, they're fun and are absolutely <laughs> worth checking out. So it was great to get you on the show, because I know you're not exactly the hugest fan of Carpenter, which is when we were coming up with this show originally, you were one of the people I talked to about possibly co-hosting it, but attempts to watch some more Carpenter didn't go well. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was like I had seen Halloween and I had seen The Thing, I think, at that point. And my common complaint is I don't really care about these characters and the pacing in particular is really slow. Mm hmm other people call it suspense. I call it get on with it. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I tried watching a couple other of his films when you had suggested it to me. And I was like, you know, I just don't want to be sitting there every time going, this is moving too slow. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. So I, I decided, no, I'd rather y'all get somebody on who is a little more open to his style and maybe would enjoy some things and not enjoy others. How's that working, Julia? I try my best. <laughs> <laughs> but no, while we haven't always agreed, it's been always been fun discussing it with you in the past. So thank you again for joining us this episode. Oh, no problem. So, and the reason we are here, with you being the resident Stephen King expert, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> is because we are covering John Carpenter's Stephen King's Christine, which was released on December 9th of 1983. The budget was $9.7 and it pulled in a total U.S. gross of just over $21 million, so it did actually classify as a hit back in the day, even though it didn't do very popularly with critics. The film was directed by John Carpenter, who once again collaborated on the score with Alan Howarth. After splitting with Universal for a little while, this was Carpenter's first film for Columbia TriStar, with whom he'll also do Starman. The film is, of course, based on the novel by Stephen King, and we will be getting to that book a little bit further down the road. Mm -hmm. If you don't know who Stephen King is, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> and yes, I did read the entire novel, and I do have things to say about it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, you didn't make me. You didn't make me. No, I didn't. I've owned that book for like a decade. It's just sitting here among another dozen King books that I've never read. Anyways, though Carpenter had been previously attached to do the adaptation of Firestarter, this marks the one and only actual collaboration between he and King. This is the first of three collaborations between Carpenter and screenwriter Bill Phillips, Others we'll be covering are the TV movie western El Diablo and Carpenter's unproduced remake of Creature from the Black Lagoon. Phillips primarily wrote TV movies, most notably numerous entries in the Jack Reed series, co-written with, directed by, and starring Brian Dennehy, and also wrote films like Michael Crichton's Physical Evidence, Fire with Fire, The Beans of Egypt, Maine, and There Goes the Neighborhood, which is also the only film he directed. And I will say I did read the screenplay. I'm not really going to have much to say about it at the end of the show because it's pretty much exactly what they shot. It was a really good read. I actually think Phillips fits well with Carpenter, and having read his Creature from the Black Lagoon adaptation, the also Carpenter, I'm really looking forward to exploring some more of his work through this project. The film was again co-produced with Larry Franco, who again also served as first assistant director. The film was produced by Richard Kobritz, who also executive produced Someone's Watching Me. This was the only other collaboration between Carpenter and Kobritz, who also produced Alien Nation and Fear, and had also been producer of the 1979 version of Stephen King's Salem's Lot. The film was executive produced by Mark Tarlov and Kirby McCauley, the latter of whom was Stephen King's literary agent, and this is his one and only producing credit. 
After four straight films as well as two additional Halloween sequels, this marks the beginning of the part between John Carpenter and cinematographer Dean Cundey, who was off shooting Psycho 2 and DC Cab around this time, and was just one year away from beginning a successful series of collaborations with Robert Zemeckis and Steven Spielberg. So on Christine, Carpenter instead reunited with Donald M. Morgan, his cinematographer on Elvis. Morgan has primarily worked on television and TV movies, but he's also done a handful of films like Used Cars, Skate Town USA, and the Stephen King classic, The Rage Carry 2. <laughs> Which I think was the first one that you and I did together, wasn't it? That was our first collaborative effort, yes. <laughs> yes, when I did all of these Stephen King sequels. Oh, the memories. <laughs> Some returning names... Also coming back are special effects supervisor Roy Arbogast, effects technician Gary Zink, camera assistant Tony Rivetti, set decorator Claudia Rebar, construction coordinator Walt Hadfield, sound mixers Tommy Kazi, Steve Maslow, and Elliot Tyson, sound editors John Post, David Stone, and David Udall, Foley artists John Adams and Stephen Rice, key grip Carl Sterry and grip Clay Wilson, stunt performers Mike McGonna and Dick Warlock, transportation coordinator Eddie Lee Volker, first aid Maurice Costello, and boom operator Joe Brennan. Returning for the last time, this is the last of two films for actor Harry Dean Stanton. This is the last of three films for labor foreman Andy Flores and dialogue editor Ken Sweet. The last of four films for hairstylist Frankie Bergman. This is the last of five films for still photographer Kim Gottlieb. Showing up for the first time, actor David Spielberg, no relation, the teacher in the shot class who kicks out Buddy Reperton, he will appear again way down the road in the Carpenter-written TV movie Silent Predators. Production illustrator George Jensen will also be the visual effects art director on Big Trouble in Little China. His other credits include Escape to Witch Mountain, Close Cars of the Third Kind, 1941, Return of the Jedi, 2010, Masters of the Universe, Red Dawn, Dune, The Rocketeer, Terminator 2, and Leonard Part 6. Oh no. He was also layout artist on the Star Trek The Animated Series. Now, this is the first of three films for editor Marion Rothman, who will also work on Starman and Memoirs of an Invisible Man. This was near the end of her career, with other credits including The Boston Strangler, Beneath an Escape from Planet of the Apes, Billy Jack, Funny Lady, Orca, and Mystic Pizza. This is the first of three films for set designer William J. Durrell Jr., who will also do Starman and be the art director on They Live. His other credits include Roadhouse, Rocky V, Die Hard, The Brady Bunch Movie, and Weeds. This is the first of three films for property master Kent H. Johnson, who will also do Big Trouble in Little China and Prince of Darkness. This is the first of three films for sound mixer Robert J. Litt, who will also do They Live and Memoirs of an Invisible Man. He's a three-time Oscar nominee for his work on Mississippi Burning, The Shawshank Redemption, and The Green Mile. This is the first of three films for boom operator Hank Garfield, who will also do Starman and return years later to do sound for Vampires. This is the first of three films for special effects technicians Ken Quibble and Richard Wood, who will both also do Starman. Quibble will then be effects coordinator on Prince of Darkness, and Wood will do unit effects for Village of the Damned. This is the first of five films for production designer Daniel A. Lomino, who will also do Starman, Prince of Darkness, and Body Bags, as well as be art director of They Live. He also worked on these roles in Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, Child's Play, Date Movie, Epic Movie, and Disaster Movie. Some bonus names to mention, Roseanne, the cheerleader who always has the hots for Dennis, is an early role for Kelly Preston, who has gone on to become a successful character actor and is the wife of John Travolta. Assistant editor Virginia Katz will go on to become editor of Dream Girls and both installments of the Twilight Saga Breaking Dawn. I think that's the first time we've mentioned Twilight on this show. Mm -hmm. And this is the last work of makeup supervisor Bob Don, who passed away during post-production and to whom the film is dedicated. In a career going back to the 50s, his credits include The Ten Commandments, Around the World in 80 Days, Psycho, Leave it to Beaver, Alfred Hitchcock Presents, Beach Blanket Bingo, Star Trek, Mission Impossible, Black Sunday, and Raise the Titanic. So that's all I have in terms of production notes. It's kind of interesting that this is a bit of a transitional film of a lot of his old crew is starting to move away. He's starting to bring in new people who will stick with him for a few films. Anyways, why don't we go ahead and just take a break here to talk about the movie itself and any previous history we may have had. Alex, I'll go ahead and start with you. Pretty limited. One time I rented this movie with Julia and we watched it and we said, that's pretty good. And then I never thought about it again. <laughs> and Julia, is that the only time you'd seen it? Uh, yes, I was also there. <laughs> <laughs> and agree. Okay. Angie? Well, I guess I never actually said. Oh, yeah. I watched it, I believe it was last year, maybe year before. I don't know. Everything runs together. For the series I was doing called Castle Rock Companion, where I read either a novel or short story by Stephen King. And then I watch the film adaptation and I compare the two and review them on their own merits. 
So that was both my first time reading the book and my first time watching the movie. Okay. And we will have a link to that review in the show notes. And this is the second time watching it now for this one. Okay. And this is one I, I can't remember if I've only seen it once or twice. I saw it back late 90s when I was going through a lot of Carpenter stuff for the first time. I may have seen it a few times at that point, and I think I saw it once again maybe about a decade ago. But it's definitely a film that's kind of always stuck with me. It'll be interesting to hear what you all think of it. Why don't we just also take a moment here, because Angie did this rather long project, currently on hiatus, but you really knocked through quite a bit of it. I went through every existing adaptation so far. There's obviously, I mean, so many in development constantly. That's right. And right before the break, you were starting to do his original film and TV stuff. Right. Given how much material of his has been adapted, that's still a lot of stuff. <laughs> Yeah. So you definitely have a history with Stephen King. Yes, I think I've actually read like a good two thirds or more of his novels, which is saying a lot. It's pretty staggering. Yeah. Yeah. About how far back does your interest in King go? Probably in my early teen years, that special time when we tend to get obsessed with things and hold on to them forever. I saw the Stan miniseries on TV and absolutely fell in love with it. And from there, just read pretty much anything of his I could get my hands on. Took a break for a while, but obviously with this project, I've been revisiting them in the last few years. And having made my own attempts to go through all of King, breaks help. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of it. <laughs> he has good phases and bad phases. That's the best way I can describe it. <laughs> For me, honestly, it's just I find his stuff gets very repetitive after a while, but he still then will come up with some new things that catch you by surprise. Mm -hmm. Alex, what's your history with Stephen King? Uh, I was about 12 years old. I saw the miniseries for It, which at the time scared the pants off me, and now it is pretty laughably bad <laughs> uh, <laughs> in retrospect. So I read the book, which really scared the pants off of me. Then I dabbled with some of his books, anything that was on my mom's bookshelf, basically, which was like a weird assortment of Tears of the Dragon and the, I think the Talisman as well. Oh, wow. Then I got my hands on a copy of The Dark Tower, book one, and I read that on vacation on a dock and I was hooked from then on. I've read many of his books, but I've fallen off the horse a long time ago, so it's been a while since I read a new King book. It's a very large horse, and it's still running, so there's still... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's off in the distance somewhere. Julia? Yes. What's your history with King? Right. <laughs> um, it was short but intense, and quite a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> Much like a King story. I was probably 12 or 13, Best and I read It... I think was the first one I ever read. And then I kind of read like a whole bunch of them sort of like between 12 and 15. And then I kind of moved on and went on to something else. But I totally read it and I loved it. And I hated the movie, the mm -hmm. made for TV monstrosity, <laughs> whatever that is. And I read that dragon one. The dragon book, what was that? Uh, Tears of the Dragon. The one that he did with the other guy? Eyes of the Dragon, actually. Eyes of the Dragon, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> that one was okay. amazing. Randall Flags of the Dragon. Just because it was too <laughs> yeah. like really different writers writing together. So I always used to make fun of it that it would be like Stephen King and it's like, okay, so we've got some plot here and some people are having some emotions and then it would go to the other, it was it Strauss? Is that was his name? Strong. Yeah. And he would just be like obsessed with the sexuality of the dragons. So just <laughs> no, like, it, and then like the, the heaving scales. I think you're thinking of the... <laughs> I think you're thinking of talisman. The, the talisman. talisman. That's no, the two of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're the two yeah. of them together. The heaving, the heaving, glistening scales, <laughs> the dragon and the hot breath on the inside thighs of someone. I don't know. But it was great because I was 13. Of course. I might need to check that book out now. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and then my most into it time was when he did the series that came out one book at a time. Green Mile. Green Mile. Yeah. The yeah. Green Mile. So I actually bought them as they came out and was at Kohl's on like release day for every day that they came out so that I could get them and read them. And I had them all on my shelf because nice. I was a really big nerd. And kind of like after that, I think I did Needful Things and then a couple other ones. Oh, that one where Nightmares she's and Dreamscapes. You, you seem oh, to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because see, I was hanging out of the library a lot, right? Mm -hmm. My mom used to get books on tape all the time. And Nightmares and Dreamscapes was actually a book on tape that oh. I got, which was read by celebrities. <laughs> so, like, they got, oh, what's the name of the actor that killed those people in Ireland? Blake? Tom Hanks. Oh. No, it, <laughs> Matthew Broderick. <laughs> so, oh, Matthew Broderick yeah. reads one. Anyways, terrifying. 
terrifying. The finger in the, the bathtub. The finger in the yeah. bathtub. Yeah. Mm. Super scary. That really weird one where the father has sex with his daughter. Gross. I don't that know one that. where that woman's changed the bed for the whole movie. Dolores Claiborne. I think I might have read a lot of them now that I've seen them. See, that's the thing. About. Once you <laughs> get into like King, it. yeah, you go like really deep. There's so many where you're just like, we could do a whole podcast. I didn't have any friends. <laughs> <laughs> and I stayed at home a lot and did a lot of reading. You're reading better stuff than me. I was reading Fear Street <laughs> on my lunch at school because I had no friends. <laughs> See, I couldn't read R.L. Stein after I read King. It was like, this is baby stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's regressive. <laughs> As someone who's gone back to R.L. Stein from Stephen King. <laughs> to Goosebumps. I actually have. I've gone back and re read the Goosebumps books. Nice. I was all about Christopher Pike. Yeah. I love Pike. Oh, I love Christopher Pike too, yes. I've got a whole shelf of Pike. I got a whole shelf of Pike. <laughs> Talk about like, Arthur repeating himself, though. <laughs> yeah, but at least it's still readable. Which isn't to say the king isn't, but Stein. Yeah. Actually, the moving finger, that story with the finger, that was actually my introduction to King. I saw the episode of it as a kid. It was an 80s anthology series called Monsters. Yeah, I think I saw that too, yeah. actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that just freaked me the hell out as a kid. The thing is, I mostly just knew King through cultural osmosis in terms of like, I knew a lot of about The Shining and Carrie and stuff like that, but I'd never actually seen them. I'd always see the ads for like It and The Stand and whatever the big movies out were each year, but I'd never see them. I know I saw The Shining at some point, but that was just because my dad was showing me Kubrick. Uh, and it wasn't until I was just getting into high school, the book that actually got me into King was Running Man. Hmm. And that was just because I liked the Schwarzenegger movie, saw the book on the shelf, which was actually an edition that was just credited to Richard Bachman. So I didn't even know it was a Stephen King book that I was reading. <laughs> and then I got the Bachman books. And then that led me to read The Rage, which, you know, as a teenager is like one of those mind blowing works. Yeah. And then I think I started watching some of the movies. That's when I watched the Stand miniseries for the first time and really liked it. Something mm. smells wrong, mm. really badly wrong. <laughs> what is that one? Langoliers? Or is that The Stand? Oh, I don't remember. It's not The Stand. There's so much. People don't realize what a pop culture force Stephen King is, how much he's permeated yeah. everything. because he's so widespread. He's in there. Yeah. He's mm -hmm. well woven. He was in Visa commercials back in the day. Yeah. I remember that, yeah. Didn't he have, like, the, um, what's that award for? Guinness? The Guinness Award for, like, most yes. works that have been adapted to, like, movies or TV? I believe he's still got it, yeah. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, he turns out so much work. Yep. He does. And then I had, like, a period, I want to say right after I got out of high school, so around 2000, 2001, where I actually tried going through all of his work, like, in chronological order. Everyone's done that at least once. No <laughs> one has made it out alive. <laughs> yeah, I made it up to, I want to say the Dead Zone is where I stopped, or maybe it was, I can't remember if Dead Zone or Firestarter. It's not very far. <laughs> well, I made it up to, like, 1980. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I got all of his, like, 60 short stories and then all the stuff he did in the 70s. I made it through The Stand. I think The Stand burned me out. That's as far as I made it. Well, yeah, Dark Tower was actually what I started. It was the first book of Dark Tower, and I only read mm. the first, like, the four or five stories in that. I only read four of them and a short story of the Dark Tower, and then I gave up. I will return one day. I'm on the last book for my second read-through of it right now, so. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I'll read it at some point. I have the entire series. I love the first four books. I've still had, like, the majority of Stephen King's books from when I tried that entire read-through, so I still have a bunch of them lying around. And then your project actually got me to go back and revisit some of them when I covered all the sequels. Yeah. And then I actually just wanted to use your project to then just start reading all the other stuff, but that didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Stephen King, he is just kind of like an interesting force. And then, yeah, this is the one and only time that him and Carpenter collaborated. And as far as I know, Stephen King doesn't hate the movie. I know he's been kind of a little picky about some of the changes, but I know he himself has said that he wasn't hugely satisfied with how the book turned out himself. He shouldn't be. I don't entirely disagree with him. Right. <laughs> Which we'll get to. And then I know John Carpenter had a period where he was really proud of the film, but then he kind of distanced himself from it, but then he's kind of come back to really being fond of it. Audio commentary is really great, by the way. He just is really excited to watch it again because he hadn't seen it in a while. So I think that's a pretty nice overview of where we all are in terms of Stephen King. If I can just get through the synopsis here real quick. Mm -hmm. Arnie Cunningham, an awkward teen, buys his first car when he sees it sitting in the yard of a dilapidated home. She's a 58 Plymouth Fury named Christine, and she's such a wreck that Arnie's parents, as well as his best friend Dennis, try to talk him out of it. But Arnie's set, renting out a lot in the junkyard fix-it-yourself garage of Will Darnell. Arnie fully restores the car in an astounding amount of time, and his personality starts changing. His looks clear up, he becomes more confident, starts dating a popular young woman named Lee, even starts getting work with Darnell around the shop. His confidence turns into ego and rage as he starts lashing out at his family and Dennis, who doesn't see Arnie for a while after being badly injured in a football game, leading the two to begin drifting apart. 
When Lee expresses her fear of the car after nearly choking to death inside of it, Arnie lashes out at her as well. Things hit the tipping point when Buddy Remberton and his gang, who were kicked out of school when their bullying of Arnie backfired, get revenge by breaking into the shop and trashing Christine. Arnie sets about obsessively rebuilding her, but also finally learns the truth as he watches her rebuild herself one night. Their link is complete and Christine starts running down Buddy and his gang in violent hit-and-run executions. Cops start sniffing around and Lee and Dennis start falling together over their mutual concerns for Arnie in fear of Christine, and ultimately spring a trap one night, locking Christine in the shop and ambushing her with a bulldozer. She still puts up one hell of a fight, even after Arnie is thrown from her and killed, but they ultimately crush her beneath the dozer's tires. So Alex, do you recommend this movie? No. It's a soft no. I have a lot of affection for it. It's more inventive than your average 80s horror film at this time, and usually I wouldn't put Carpenter films in that vein, but this is definitely an 80s horror film. It's not as Carpenter as his other films, and it does have some charm, and the performances are energetic and volatile, but ultimately it didn't really work for me in this particular viewing. Julian? I'm going to go with a soft yes. <laughs> I did enjoy it. I had a lot of issues. <laughs> as we'll discuss. I had a lot of problems, as I do with most things in life. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I've been thinking about it since I have watched it over the past day or so, and I actually have a slightly warm feeling about it now, which is kind of weird. But mm. there it is. It's in there. I think it's the king. I'm going to be honest. Yeah, I don't think it's the like Americana. That. There is just a certain skew and a certain angle for all of Stephen King's stories, I think, which unfortunately, it's that feeling that I think is the hardest to translate into film. Mm. But it tries damn hard. There's just so many inexplicable things going on that it's also kind of endearing. I start writing down my notes and I'm on like page three where I'm just kind of like, oh, you're trying your best. You know, like, mm -hmm. <laughs> look at you out there trying to explain why that car's crazy. <laughs> you go, you go. And for that, I give it a soft yes. A sideways thumbs up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Angie? Ultimately, no. There are elements of it that I like. Part of it is I feel like it's going from a flawed King novel to begin with. To me, I just couldn't get into it as fully as I'd like to when it's not the kind of movie that I could revisit again on a regular basis. You're all a bunch of shitters. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually one of my favorite Carpenter movies. I still really enjoy it. I find it a nice mix of the Strong King plot and the Strong King characters that even he didn't really handle very well, mixed with the style of Carpenter. And I just, I love the mood of this movie. I love the pace of the movie. I love the way the movie shot, the editing, the music. I really like this one. This one just really works for me. And it has a little more depth and meat to it than a lot of Carpenter's films, but it's also a lot leaner and tighter than the King book. So for me, it's kind of a nice, perfect fusion of these two styles. It's just one of those weird things where it's like, I've always really enjoyed this film and everyone else has just been kind of like, eh. <laughs> I'm not entirely surprised, but I've never fully understood it. So I'm going to be curious to discuss it with you all. Well, we're split down the middle, so yeah. let's battle. <laughs> Round one, go, Alex. <laughs> it's stupid. <laughs> I disagree. <laughs> Kinda. <laughs> Why don't we start with Keith Gordon as, as Arnie? Because I will admit, I do think while I like where his performance starts, I do think it gets away from him as it goes further and further along. It really bugged me that they were going for the, oh, look, he's got huge glasses, so he's a total nerd, so you won't notice when he becomes attractive later when we take them off. Like, it was just... I don't know. And then the greased hair, everything about his characterization, just I didn't care for it at all. Well, it seems like denim is good. If you're wearing a leather <laughs> jacket, you're bad. <laughs> <laughs> or leather vest, as it were, which is even worse. Well, I will say with the glasses, the actors playing Arnie and Dennis are actually the same size. So they were trying to do whatever they could to make them look smaller early on. Mm. But yeah, no, those were some really big glasses. Yeah. He plays it so broad at first. Like, and when he's nerdier, he's very Jerry Lewis, where he's just like, I'm going to walk in a puddle. Where am I going? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that first scene. Oh, man. My thing about Keith Gordon, I love Keith Gordon. I really enjoy this period where he was suddenly getting a lot of really big roles. And then he went off to become his own filmmaker, which he still does to this day. I do feel that there is a theater quality to his role that doesn't always click. Like, more he's doing, like, stage acting than film acting. I like his performance here, though there are parts where it does get a little too broad and puts a little too much into it. 
I would agree with that. I think definitely on the theater aspect of it, I think where he shines is when he monologues, like the one speech towards the end when he's in the car. I think it's about the shitters and everything like that. It's great. Like he does a really fantastic job. But when he's interacting, especially with Lee, it gets a little um, silly. Yeah. I think it's more because he is committed. Like, he's Mm -hmm. there, and I feel like she was kind of calling it in. Oh, yeah, she was not very good. No. Yeah. He didn't really have a lot to work with Mm -hmm. there, so he kept pushing harder. Yeah. And then she just kept backing up. (laughs) I do kind of appreciate at the end he goes full cage to the point where he's just like, yeah! Yeah. I mean, what else are you going to do, though, man? You're acting against a car. That's true. It would make you go bigger than you're supposed to. (laughs) Hey, Bob Hoskins acted against cartoons back before that was the norm, so. (laughs) If we could go a day without mentioning Bob Hoskins. Never. <laughs> One of those was a cartoon car, too. Let's That's remember true, the taxi yeah. cab. It was. <laughs> I will admit, the other issue I have with the movie is Alexandra Paul as Lee. Yeah. yeah. To be fair, I think she's much better here than she was in the book. She was awful in the book. But here, I find Alexandra is just flat. This was like one of her first roles, and she's still a continuing actor and and was like, I think, the longest running actor on Baywatch. Oh, wow. (laughs) I actually misremembered it. I thought it was actually the actress from Last Starfighter that was in this movie, and it wasn't. But yeah, it's she is kind of flat. She's a little too amateurish is the way I would say yeah. it. Yeah. She sounds like she woke up from a nap with every dialogue she delivers. It was just yeah. confusing because they set her up as being this, oh, she's uh, she's got a body for sin and she's so awesome. And then she's like, hey, guys, no, I don't want to go on a date with you. I have no charisma. My name's Lee. I'm wearing two lots. <laughs> There's nothing to back it up. Like, what's the appeal besides the fact that she's new? I'm smart because right. I'm at the library. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's the way it was supposed to be, was that she's hot, but she's not interested in going out and having fun. She is genuinely interested in her education and stuff like that. And people are drawn to her because she's cut herself off while also mm-hmm. being that attractive. So it's that whole stupid teen boy mentality. Oh, yeah. Which, my God, the book gets into. Uh, <laughs> Oh, yes. They are a bunch of vulture wolves. It's creepy. But uh, yeah, I don't know why Kelly Preston is ostracized by these boys, but she's (laughs) like revered because they both have exactly as much conversation with these boys. So they don't really know who actually has something to say. They've just kind of like the blonde (laughs) one is no good. The brunette one thumbs up. Well, I think part of it is that we're missing the part where her and Arnie start. Yes, that's true. Where It's like we just go from them being like characters who they're passed on cross at all to suddenly they're together and we don't see see that bit where she connected with him intellectually. Mm -hmm. Is that how it happened in the book that Dennis only finds out after the fact? It's been a while since I read it. Do you remember? Uh, Is it a twist in the book? (laughs) It was more of a gradual thing. Because I feel like that was part of the issues with this movie is that they were almost afraid to add on to what was in the book. Like, places where they probably could have filled in holes and made it a little better, they were almost afraid to do. Honestly, it's a 500-page book, so they were creating holes by pulling it out. The book went way far out of its way to fill holes. Not not always very well. well. But my point is, is that a lot of the book, since the beginning and the end, are both told in first person from Dennis's perspective. So a lot of it is what you're getting from what he knows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that you're not going to entirely understand what's happening with Arnie. But for me, when you're a movie, you no longer have that narration. You should be going in depth. You should be showing us everything. Yeah, and I did notice that they did actually significantly reorder a lot of events. Like the whole fight with Buddy Repperton happened like almost halfway into the novel Mm -hmm. instead of being up front. And in fact, that's a kind of ongoing thing where he also used to work for Will Darnell and he got fired because of his messing with Arnie. And then, yeah, the whole Christine, the book opens with them seeing Christine. We don't see Christine until like 15, 20 minutes in. Well, don't know. Mm-hmm. Except for the prologue. I have to say, you start with her on the assembly line and immediately yeah. killing a guy. Mm-hmm. The only thing that really bothered me was just the whole Arnie Lee thing. You lose that introduction. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So their relationship feels thin. She's not playing it. He's not yeah. having much he can play off of. It's like, I guess we're supposed to be shocked along with Dennis, but... Mm. Yeah. I mean, even in the script... Pretty much everything in the script made it to screen except for just a couple of bits here and there. So it's not like you can't even say that they cut anything from that. Mm -hmm. I'm not entirely sure what got lost in the translation there. And it's kind of sad that this is our third Lee in a Carpenter film. And she sure doesn't live up to the last two. (laughs) She's a lower Lee. Yeah. Yeah. She's a Demi Lee. Well, I liked it. 
That's one of my favorite parts, actually, was when it goes from, like, him just being this total nerd who's, like, working on his car to a football game where the cool guy is supposed to be playing football. And in the corner of his eye, he sees this total, like, nerd guy macking down on the hottest girl in school in front of this super shiny car Mm -hmm. and stuff. Mm -hmm. I actually quite liked that. I liked that it fast forwarded the story. Mm -hmm. So you're immediately into the fact that he's turning a little bit evil, that he already has this confidence. I also liked the fact that it made the relationship that he had with Lee seem as cheap as it actually was. Because without having the backstory of them, like, making friends and slowly having, like, feelings for each other and then him finally getting the confidence to be with her, he just has confidence and she was attracted to it. And then they started this relationship that ultimately didn't actually mean that much. Power shift. (laughs) (laughs) I like that. I thought that was clever. That was one of my favorite parts, actually. She is someone who genuinely cares for people. So she didn't want a cheap relationship with the jock who's hitting on her in the school. She Mm -hmm. wanted someone who is not from that style, and then Arnie became that person. Got her brains, not just her killer bod. But then Arnie, through there's that whole theme about the masculinity that people hinge on their cars and all that stuff, Mm -hmm. and how it brings out, like, the douche bro in him. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you can see then why she's just kind of like, really, this is ultimately what it's going to turn out to be, but she still cares about him because she saw that early glimmer. But I think we're still missing her having seen that early glimmer. Yeah. To add to the uh, missing pieces of the story, we are at a very strong emotional point all the way through the movie because we're only really getting these key emotional scenes where we're in the middle of a fight, we're in the middle of a game, we're in the middle of an accident or a murder. So it's like teenage life where you're just like, emotion, emotion, emotion. I like that because Arnie is a character who is at a point of frustration in his life. And he sees this one thing that he hopes will make everything better, and it ultimately makes everything worse. And we've all been there. And everyone's so angry. Everyone <laughs> all is the so time. angry all the time. Everyone. We get the West Side Story with the bullies, which just goes from zero to borderline attempted murder. Yeah. And like really quick. And then they talk to the teacher who is throttling his students. Super aggro. Every single thing these people have done. <laughs> he means goes back jail to his time. parents. <laughs> his parents are crazy angry. Yep. Everyone's having like just. Mr. Darnell is his name? Yeah, the super angry shop guy. <laughs> Who's also surprisingly sweet at times. He's like, you know, know, maybe if you clean up, I'll throw you a few bucks. I'll think about it. What the fuck do you mean you'll think about it? I know, but his introduction <laughs> is basically like, hey, sir, eat shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I loved that because that actor I'm always so used to seeing in like sweet grandfatherly roles and seeing him here where he's just like the most loathsome person mm-hmm. around. <laughs> Why did he bother putting on a tie in the morning? <laughs> It's a good question. <laughs> I think it's an important thing to look into. <laughs> he is not in a tie-based profession. It's just going to get caught in the motors. It's, it's it's constantly filthy and just hanging from the side of his neck, and yet he puts on that tie and jacket every day. You got to be a professional. Kid. You <laughs> He's not going to do it. Who is? I don't stand people smoking in their shop. Those people are smoking. What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> I love Robert Perotsky. And then, yeah, everyone is so pissed off and so high strung and so charged up. And then you get the character of Dennis, who's just kind of like drifting through all this. Like, what the hell's going on? Which I love. Sort of there. Yeah. (laughs) But I don't dislike that because, oddly enough, he is still our eyes. He is still kind of our proxy through which we're seeing this story. And so he's the one who's taking it in and reacting to it and then ultimately acting in the end. Yeah. I think he did a fine job. I think his basic motivation is, what's going on? Okay, I guess I'll get out of this situation. But I even just love bits like where Arnie's mom just suddenly starts yelling at him, like, why didn't you stop him from doing this? And he's like, I did try to. (laughs) And how do you feel about the mom, Julia? I love that brash bitch of a mom. (laughs) I love her. (laughs) She was fantastic. I think she deserved 15 minutes more screen time. Yeah. I want a monologue. Yep. <laughs> I want a full conversation between her and her husband <laughs> about how they're not raising their child properly. And I want to see her go on a coffee date with her girlfriend to talk about it. She was on some D. Wallace shit. I loved it. I want to believe that she is who Annie from Halloween would have grown into. I could see that, yeah. Because you have that opening bit where she's yelling at Dennis about noise pollution. That so much reminds me of Annie when she's yelling after the car, speed kills, asshole. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Here's a question, everybody. Mm -hmm. Why does Arnie like Christine so much? What's the initial attraction? Like, obviously, she's a demon car. They did talk about that on the commentary, where it was Carpenter and Keith Gordon. It was just supposed to be love at first sight. 
I guess so, yeah. I feel like that's one of my issues with the movie is that, I mean, I understand show don't tell, but I feel like a lot of motivations and things could have been a little better explained. Like, I knew because I had read the book is how I felt like yeah. things were happening. Like, if mm -hmm. I hadn't read the book, I feel like I would have been lost. And the book has some major swaths of plot that we'll get yes. to. But here, I got it that Christine will kind of latch on to people. People who are kind of vulnerable and who mm -hmm. are frustrated and don't have anything else in their lives. And I just figured that was just the next one if he's just the latest one that she grabbed on to. I would have appreciated like a close-up or something of him locking eyes on Christine just to show the significance of it. Because it's basically like, hey, what's that over there? That's a car. Now it's my obsession. Yeah. The way I always saw it, and though I will agree that the film doesn't really clarify this, is I always saw that scene with Arnie first meeting Christine is very much like when Bilbo gets the ring from Gollum. Mm -hmm. You know, the ring fell off of Gollum because it was no longer interested in him and saw a better opportunity somewhere else. In the original book, it's Roland LeBay who's selling the car, the guy who owned the right. car, not his brother. And so it's like the car is leaving him and going to someone else. Hmm. I wouldn't think Christine well, would let him sell the car. There's a lot more to it than that. I think, actually, I think Roland gives up the car intentionally to set yeah. the events in motion. I almost feel like I should go ahead and bring up this bit of plot. <laughs> Do it, because I want to know. <laughs> yes, like, yeah. what happens in the book is that Roland, he, his child would die. Yeah, Christine is not really an intelligent thing. It's Roland no. LeBay, the ghost of Roland LeBay. Okay. His child died, his wife died in the car. He's where the shitters come from. He thinks everyone is a shitter. He hates, he hates, 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 hates humanity is mm. the best way I could describe it. But he loves his car. Essentially, the way I took it, starts to perform a kind of black magic by letting his child die, letting his wife die. In the car. In the car. And that way, he's going to let this young kid take his car and then he'll die and his soul will inhabit the boy and he will live forever with his car. Yeah. So Arnie is basically being possessed by Roland LeBay. Whenever Arnie goes away, it's the ghost of Roland LeBay that's driving Christine and killing people. Like you mm -hmm. literally see the grinning ghost behind the wheel and all that stuff. Okay. I kind of mm -hmm. like the movie better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and I'll be honest, I do too, because I prefer the idea of the car itself just being this corrupt. I actually really love the prologue where she's literally just born bad. Yeah. And is this corrupting thing that just latches on to people? Yeah. See, I appreciate that more. I would have liked more backstory and more emphasis put on that aspect in the movie, but I prefer that to a grinning ghost. See, <sighs> I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Go nuts. The whole thing also yeah. with him sacrificing the children to both bring the car life and then also getting these deeper powers. It was so much like the Mangler. Mm. It was basically the exact same yeah. plot as the Mangler. But what I liked about it, at least from what I remember, is that it's not like Roland goes and like finds a book about ritual. Yeah, no, it just kind of happened. He's just that full of hate. That he just kind of stumbled into wizardry. Right. I knew the shitter lines were Stephen King as soon as I heard oh, them. I'm like, that's yeah. King. Yeah. Anything <laughs> yeah. with shitting or farts, that's always Stephen King. So just yeah. the idea that hate could be that powerful, I guess, is what really appeals to me as the opposite of, you know, oh, no, this car just happens to be bad. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, like, mm. I find them both equally valid in terms of what I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. But I do. I like the leaner story of the movie compared to the broader story of the book. That's fair. In the movie logic, it just makes little sense because Christine's so sneaky before she gets with Arnie and then she's like super escalation. Well, it's, she's building the connection. I guess, yeah. The connection needs to gestate. But it's like a, such a large leap from like slamming my hood on someone's fingers to <laughs> driving myself over some teenagers. Unless you bring into the fact that this is something that she's done before with her past owner. It's possible. Well, the film, like, removing a lot of that backstory leaves that open of you could fill yeah. in. I should say the character in the movie, George LeBay, the character of Roland LeBay did have a brother named George who then mm -hmm. Dennis tracked down and found out a lot of backstory. They kind of fuse the two characters. The character who first sells the car, that's basically the Roland LeBay of the book with the weird back brace and everything. Yeah. And then George LeBay is the version that we meet later on who gives him more backstory. It's a little clumsily handled in terms of like taking these very different characters and squishing them together. But I really actually prefer the, this version. But no, I, I definitely understand what you mean, though. And there's something appealing about this guy who just hates everything so much that he basically makes his own magic. 
Right. He creates an engine to burn off of the fuel of his anger without even quite realizing it. But then I love that he kind of mm-hmm. gradually realized it. And then he basically fed his wife to the car. Yeah. I just didn't like the book where it's literally the grinning zombie of Roland LeBay behind the wheel and like all of the dead victims are in the back seat laughing along. Mm. And like, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> that was so Stephen King. Well, of course it is. <laughs> the book gets a little too easy comics for me at times. I just really like the way the film is shot, too. I would agree with that, especially all of the action scenes with the car. I really loved watching those moments. Mm -hmm. I love how much play they got of the headlights just Mm -hmm. suddenly kicking on and blazing. Or I love the one where she's chasing down Moochie Wells down that alley, scraping along the sides, and then corners him in the loading dock that she can't fit in, so she forces herself to fit in to get him. Mm -hmm. That was very cool. Was that when, like, that random Artie Lang guy got dropped off in the middle of the underpass for some unknown reason, and Christine seemed to know that he was going to be there, (laughs) and there was no buildings or people or lights? No, he was getting a ride down to the warehouse there where he worked. That was not clear, no. Okay. <laughs> no, I agree with you that that was obscure. I, I, yeah. It's such an unwieldy killer, a car, that they really have to do some stretches where they're like, time to walk down this highway, hope nothing happens or there's no bricks I can hide behind. <laughs> but I also love the idea that she's just following them, waiting for an opportunity. She's got a lot of free time. She's got yeah. nothing else going on, guys. Yes. <laughs> I also love the effects that they do with the crumpling and then uncrumpling. Yes, yes. That was cool. Yeah, Julia, you were really into that. Yeah, I dug the crumpling and uncrumpling. I thought it looked really boss. Especially that whole scene where we see her regenerate the first time. Yeah, yeah that was really good. well done. Where he's like, show me. And suddenly it's like all this <laughs> sexy saxophone music. <laughs> that kind of ruined it a little yeah. bit. I'm just like, is she strip teasing? Oh, it's had a big problem with the sax. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, yeah. no, on the commentary, that's what they said. We were making it a full-on strip tease. Fair enough. <laughs> Whatever floats your boat, Arnie. Is it not odd that everyone just seems so open to the possibility that Christine is evil and is making him turn evil? Like, everyone's very suspicious of an inanimate thing. Everyone's very aggro against Christine. Super aggro against Christine from day one. Like, they smell it. Yeah, they're like, I bought a new car. I don't like that car, uh, man. Yeah, you got to get rid of it. Here. That is one thing that the novel had the benefit of. Of The thing yeah. about Christine is that underneath the new car smell, there's this kind of decay yeah. that everyone mm. but Arnie can smell. I see. And because the novel does take place over, like, three months, and the film does have these little date title cards. What was the yeah, point of the does. date? Yeah, they didn't really matter for the movie. Yeah, I know. There was no reason for them except just to clarify that this is not happening over the span of a few weeks. Yeah, I'm I'm an adult. I'm capable of understanding (laughs) the passage of time. I I don't. I saw Christmas decorations, (laughs) which I love. As you're getting into December, there's no snow anywhere. They could be down south. It's California. Yeah, or California. There you go. It's in California. It says it's set in California. Oh, okay. And the first title card is California. Okay, I didn't catch that. They changed that from the book. I caught something. (laughs) Take that, everybody! I read a title card. (laughs) The book is again up in the whole New England area, so there's like snow everywhere throughout most. Of it. Wait a minute, Stephen King set a book in New England? I Bangor know, or Castle right? Rock. Bangor what? or Castle Rock. <laughs> I don't right. think it's either one. Or sometimes Derry. Oh yeah, Derry. I think it hey, was Derry. Is Connecticut <laughs> the state that's still up there? Because I think it was in Connecticut. Really? Connecticut's New England, so I mean it could be. Grant, I think this was right when Stephen King moved to Connecticut, so all of his books are suddenly in Connecticut. Well, we were all wrong on this one. It's actually set in Libertyville, Pennsylvania. The length of the book did definitely allow for more saturation of everyone just being like, there's no other answer that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because the book got a lot more into the police officer who's investigating everything and all that stuff. Meanwhile, yeah, it's like in the movie, it's like Harry Dean Stanton shows up and he's like, so your car's fixing itself rather quickly. Yeah. <laughs> How would you know that? I am on this. <laughs> well, everyone knows, A, he has this car, how much he loves this car, where this car is at every time, who he's dating. Everyone knows the police. I know it's a small town, but it's ridiculous. So much time passes over the course of the novel that the police officer actually gets killed by Christine. Oh, my God. And another police officer takes over. That's amazing. And then he's the one who starts to believe in <laughs> Christine. <laughs> okay. That's pretty cool. Also, those bullies are everywhere. Like, they're at the football game after getting suspended. They know exactly where he works, which, as you were saying, makes more sense if they also worked at the same place, but they don't really give any of that information. So it's basically like, 
I know where he keeps that car, who I also know he's obsessed with. Their rage. Enduring it, rage. Enduring. It's like that weird Artie Lang guy, Horshack and jacked up John Travolta. Yeah. Make up <laughs> the craziest monkey gang I have ever seen, where they just go Hooping full, and hollering. full ape on that car. They're pooping on They're it? They're pooping they on pooping it. it. They're yes. smashing it. They're jumping on top of it. You could hear them. <laughs> that was me making a monkey noise. If you actually see the damage to Christine, that is yeah. like a full compactor worth of damage. I love that the camera just holds on it. Just holds on it as he climbs up on the hood, climbs up on the roof, <laughs> and then they just tear it apart. And yet they hate the guy, but they never have any kind of comeback for the guy who ends up in the hospital. I can't remember his name. Yeah. The guy who ends Dennis. up in the hospital, who's in fact the one who told on it's him true. to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. That's why they're there in the stands cheering him when he gets his legs snapped. <laughs> I had people do horrible things to me in school. I never held a grudge for longer than a week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's because you weren't the bully. That's true. I think maybe they were just like keeping up the tradition of sending 40 year olds to high school in movies. Yes, where that's true. Like these are grown ass <laughs> men. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In the oh, book, yeah. they do actually make it clear that most of them are in their 20s because they've been held back repeatedly. Yeah, that's true. Do you know what 40 year old men like to do? Steal lunches. Yeah. <laughs> That's their first priority. There was a lot of yogurt in that lunch. A lot of I know she warned us. <laughs> she said there was going to be yogurt, but it was a high yogurt to the rest of the lunch ratio. That was a pint, at least. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that was a pint of Danone. A carton of yogurt, yes. <laughs> and I don't know if you recognize the one guy who had the big, thick head of bushy hair. Horshack, yeah. He's the Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters. Yes, he's the opening of Ghostbusters. With the <laughs> oh, I was wondering who he was. I knew I knew him. <laughs> Those are his, like, only two big roles. I'm like, it's ESP. Yeah. <laughs> Who was the old guy? That was the guy from Home Alone, right? Yep. Was he the old the man old from man. Home Alone? Yeah. yeah. I was just like, wow, he's playing a Crystal Lake kook, basically. Yeah. You're doomed. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Who actually was like a beatnik and counterculture playwright back in the 50s. Well, that's incredible. <laughs> but yeah, no, the bullies, I love that you basically just have two incidents where let's just kill Moochie Wells just because he's the one who took the shit. He gets to be singled out. Oh, yeah. And then you yeah. just have this one other one where it's like, let's just take out three of them in one go. And this is the third film by Carpenter where we have the evil villain set on fire and still running after you. Yeah, which I appreciated. The car on fire is always a cool visual. It was very cool, but part of me is like, why don't you just run off the road? Well, that's the whole thing. Maybe yeah. the car would have a hard time following. <laughs> it's the car version of don't go in the barn. It's just like, stay in a building. Yeah. 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 Go in the first door you find and don't leave till daylight. Just keep running. Yeah. Yep. Don't stop. Yeah. Keep running. <laughs> that was the big thing in the book, though, where he climbs up on a snowbank and she just keeps ramming the snowbank and causing it to collapse more and more underneath him. Maybe he should find some stairs. There's got to be some somewhere in this town. <laughs> well, in the book, if I'm not mistaken... They kill someone who's climbing upstairs. <laughs> yeah, like, is it Will Darnell or somebody? Like, she actually drives into a house. And it's like, that's a bit much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Let me just go ahead and talk about Will Darnell here for a second, because he had this mm -hmm. other entire massive subplot in the book. Yeah. Will Darnell is basically also the local crime lord. Naturally. Uh, in terms of he's the guy who runs drugs, he's the gambling guy. Arnie's job for him isn't picking up spare parts. It's literally driving, like, cigarettes and booze and coke across state lines. I feel like they did at least hint at that, even if they didn't flat out say it. I honestly don't find it a necessary plot element at all. No, it's really not. I'd rather just have him be the crusty guy who owns the garage. I would appreciate that because it would explain why Christine killed Darnell. There was no she reason for Christine to, to kill Darnell. Yeah. That's actually one of my yeah. problems with the movie. And then that he had no reason to just climb in and sit in the smoldering car and enjoy it. I'm sorry, guys. Yeah. My first instinct when I see a burnt up wreck of a car is to get inside it. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I want to do. It only makes sense. If you physically hurt yourself on an object, climb inside yes. and just move around. Put your gun down. Absolutely. Yeah, just mm -hmm. chill out for a while. I want to be surrounded by ash, heat, and yeah. carbon monoxide. Yes. Constant smoke yeah. in my lungs. <laughs> That's what I want. <laughs> I actually would have had it be in the climax where they're waiting for Christine at the garage and then find out that Christine is there already waiting for them. 
just show Darnell's corpse somewhere that she just killed him while she was lying and waiting in the garage. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. That's all that character needed. Yep. Mm-hmm. The thing is, Darnell then, for that entire subplot, he then actually gets raided by the cops. Arnie gets picked up. There's an entire stretch of the book where Arnie is in jail, where they're trying to grill Arnie to spill on Darnell because they want to bust him and get his contacts down south. His parents are all freaking out because what does this mean about your college prospects? Why aren't you talking to the lawyer? You know, his mom is just all over him. Then Christine kills Darnell by literally driving into his house and like literally climbing up the stairs after him, tearing down the stairs. And and then after all of that, he just dies of a heart attack. I'd buy that more than what happened. (laughs) Yeah, I would actually buy Christine crashing into a house and going up a flight of a stairs before I would imagine that he would after a car drove itself into a garage. Then get into the burning carcass of the car. Yeah. And then for some reason, because of all of that. Burning carcass of the car. (laughs) That was a great sentence. And then for some reason, (laughs) after Darnell is killed, the police are just like, well, we're no longer interested in pursuing charges against Arnie and we're not going to put this on his record so he can still go to college. Exactly. So then he's just out of jail. (laughs) And didn't Darnell, he recognized Christine. He said, oh, I knew someone owned a car like that and talking about how evil he was. Mm -hmm. Straight up in the novels, they fully cover that he knew Roland the Bay. Mm -hmm. So he never made the connection that it was the same car? Not in the movie. In the book, yes, he did. Christine has very vague powers. Maybe she's mind controlling people. Like, what are Christine's powers? The power to be like Bumblebee and select perfectly (laughs) timed uh, songs on the radio. (laughs) Yeah, because, I mean, if she does have the power to regenerate, why did she allow herself to be in such shambles in the first place? Like, it it seemed like a point of pride, really, no? Because she needs that connection. She needs that connection with someone. She had just had that connection severed because Roland LeBay died. She wasn't going to get that connection with George LeBay. So she found Arnie and then she needed time to build that connection. And that's where he isn't even rebuilding her. He's just doing a few little tinkers here and there. She is regenerating even early in the movie. Yeah, because it doesn't make sense. Like it would cost so much money. She was so messed up. Because there's that part where Darnell and this other guy are standing there looking at Christine and just kind of marveling at this weird kind of patchwork way in that she's been rebuilt. That's because Mm -hmm. she's slowly regenerating. So she fueled by obsession. How does that help her make someone choke on a hamburger? Where do the choking powers come from, guys? Light up choking powers. (laughs) Where are those interior lights? Uh, I do love the green radio. I will give you that. I liked that. (laughs) I go with that scene because of the lighting, yeah. It doesn't make sense in terms of how she would cause it, because in the book it was more she was just taking advantage of something that was already happening. Locking the doors while she choked. Locking the door, sure. That makes sense. I think it would have worked better had they just changed it to CO2. Like, literally, she was just pumping carbon monoxide in or something. Yeah. 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 It would make sense. Mm Mm-hmm. Anything else we want to bring up? Mm, I'm going through my notes. I missed a good joke about Street Fighter level damage to the car. If anyone remembers the side missions in Street oh, Fighter. Yeah, the oh, level God, yes. levels. <laughs> yeah. I forgot about that. Get yeah. that Chun Lee kit going. Oh, my favorite was when. Is Artie the guy? Arnie's the Arnie. other protagonist, evil protagonist. The evil protagonist. When he goes to the hospital to visit his friend and he sets up that really sweet romantic date where he brings like the taper candles and lights them and gets the six pack of beer and, <laughs> and waits watching him sleep until he wakes yeah. up. To- and then leaves immediately. And then leaves right. immediately. That's the yeah. thing that the book really brings in is that the two of them are in love. It's like bros, you know? Which is why it's so upsetting for him to lose him to a car. Yeah. yeah. Right, right. But we didn't really get enough time to really fully establish that. And the thing is, you know, one's the jock, one's the nerd. But these two have, like, really seriously grown up right alongside mm-hmm. each other since they were kids. Mm-hmm. I just like that he was almost crippled, and the only card I saw just said, ouch, on it. <laughs> <laughs> I love the bit where Arnie just sets a Dixie cup on his toe for no reason. <laughs> yes, that was actually yeah. a good touch. I think they were just goofing around. But I find nice it touch. offensive that he brought in a hardback copy of 5,000, 5,000 dirty limericks. I don't get to hear one. <laughs> Those guys were obsessed with sex. All they talked well, about was sex. They are teenagers. I know, it's true. Yeah, they are teenagers. It's better than the novel. <sighs> the novel, especially the portions where it's like the first 190 pages and the last 50 pages, are from Dennis's point of view. It's Stephen King trying to explore the mind of a 17 year old jock. And doing right. way too good a job. Yeah. <laughs> Was it, oh is it Roseanne? God. Roseanne. She doesn't even get a name in the book. No, no, she is named in the book a couple of times. Is she? Just a couple of times. I just remember, yeah, that was when I was dating the cheerleader. I kept trying to get into her pants, but she wasn't giving it up. Like, who cares? Oh, yeah, no, there's actually a couple of cheerleaders. He has Roseanne <sighs> first. I actually kind of liked how the movie turned that into her being the one who's kind of hot for him, but is always being ignored. Mm-hmm. 
But no, yeah, it's just he just wants to fuck Roseanne. Yeah, He just wants to fuck the cheerleader. And then it's like she breaks up with him. So then he dates another cheerleader just in the hopes that he'll get a hand job out of it. <laughs> After his accident, Roseanne kind of came back and was like feeling really bad for him. But by then, you know, he was starting to build things with Lee. Mm -hmm. And he's always got to talk about how Lee's got legs that stretch to forever and won't quit. Oh, yeah. And he wants mm -hmm. a piece of that and blah, blah, blah. Oh, so gross. Yeah. A lot of his discussion of Lee is Lee is hot. Have I mentioned how hot she is? My God, is she hot. I've heard she's smart, but let's keep talking about her body. Yeah. yeah. And the thing about Lee is even in the books, she's always screaming in hysterics, that 1960s Sue Storm problem of, what does it mean? What's going on? Mm -hmm. Save yeah. me. You know, and then especially yeah. like during the big climax, she's just completely melting down and he's like literally having to do the whole slapping her to her senses and all that stuff. It's like, fuck you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. King really doesn't know how to write teenage girls. No. Yeah, I think we mainly talked about Stephen King, but I think that would be a point to say that Carpenter really dropped the ball there because he has such great female characters mm -hmm. all of the time. And if you had someone like Lee who really wasn't that much on paper anyways, you could actually turn her into something really interesting, especially with the final fight. When she gets into that, I don't know, machinery, the big mm. yellow thing. When she gets into the big yellow thing with the guy, and she's like, puts her arm around and puts her head down like she just can't get through life. Yeah. Like, she's yeah. like, oh, I can't even handle getting up into this machine. I can't open this door. <laughs> it's chasing me. I was like, just standing there staring, doing nothing, not helping. I know. They beefed up the main girl from the fog in, like, rewrites. Why couldn't they just do a little bit more for Lee? Just a little bit more yeah. for yeah. Lee. You know what one thing? would have actually completely made that climax even better for me. And I genuinely love the climax a lot. But have it be that when Christine catches him by surprise, she's the one who gets in the bulldozer and he's the one who's stuck on the ground because his leg is still damaged. He can't climb up there fast enough. His leg's broken. It would make perfect yeah. sense. It's true, no? yeah. I actually love that bit where he has to steer the bulldozer. He can't fight her with the bulldozer because he's using the bulldozer as a shield for Lee to switch their positions. Mm -hmm. Right now, mm -hmm. Christine is trying to take out Dennis. And it's like the two loves of Arnie's life fighting over Dennis. I agree. Rewrite. Yeah, let's rewrite it. Because <laughs> I honestly think that would have been more thematically relevant to have it be this is the ultimate thing of Arnie is finally lashing out. And like have that bit where Arnie is dying in the in the office with the impalement on him. Have that be Dennis is the one who's in that room with him sharing that moment with him. Yeah, because Lee did not mm. give a shit. No. Well, he was kind of a douche at the end. <laughs> she was probably like happy, like, oh like, man, now I don't have to break up with him. I guess, but it's still a human being dying in front of you that you did. <laughs> you know, rub his dick at the drive-in. Like, <laughs> you guys were close. <laughs> they did not really give a fitting ending to Arnie. It was basically like, ah, no. I suck, I'm dead. <laughs> that was the other thing about the novels yeah. was because it was the ghost of George LeVay driving the car. Arnie was actually off with his mom when that happened. And then it's like they killed the car. And then we find out the next day or day or two later that Arnie and his mom died at that very instant in a car accident. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. Because, like, he was so linked to her or something like that. Mm. You need to have Arnie there for the climax. I would be disappointed if they just did that same old mm -hmm. thing again. But I agree they could have staged that a bit better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why do they even decide to destroy Christine? Like, how does that escalate? That actually was a scene that they cut out. It's in the deleted scenes on the DVD. It was in the script. There's a scene where Lee and Dennis are meeting at a fast food joint and are just talking things over. And they're also kind of holding each other and kissing. And they don't see that Christine is pulling up right behind them. Mm. And then just as they turn on the lights to pull out, Arnie is standing right in front of them. And so it's like he sees them together and they realize that he's going to come for us tonight. We have to do it tonight. There's no other time to do it. And they know that Christine is the one killing people. Yeah, they've put that together. Okay. Like, don't get me wrong, the finale of a car versus a bulldozer is amazing. I'm never going to poo-poo that. <laughs> but uh, the escalation, it was just like, oh, man, what are we going to do about Arnie? Let's destroy his car. Well, yeah. I think that kind of goes back into what you were saying earlier, is like everyone figures out very quickly, oh, this car is evil. Why would they know that? We know it because we've seen the car killing people. Mm -hmm. But why do other people know it? I think it's less because they know it than more is that they're just getting such a bad vibe that they're not as unwilling to disbelieve it. Every store I go into gives me a bad vibe. I don't destroy them. <laughs> no. 
<laughs> no, and I know, and that's one thing where him putting together the pieces of what all is going on in the novel does have a lot more weight to justify right. why they ultimately take the actions that they do. Because again, it's not just the bullies that are getting killed. It's also the cop is getting killed. Will Darnell is being killed literally by a car driving through his house, you know, mm -hmm. which left all that damage behind. And the news is even covering it looks like someone drive through his house. So it's like they're putting this all together. Their parents are in danger. The parents play a much bigger role in the book, too. I agree that the book better justifies it. I still don't miss all that, though. <laughs> <laughs> the thing about the book, I've pretty much covered everything I was going to say about the book anyways in terms of content. Yeah. I did not really like the book that much. I found it ridiculously overbloated and overlong because a lot of the plot of this movie doesn't even kick in until well after like 100, 150 pages into the book mm -hmm. in terms of when he has the fight with Buddy Remberton. The whole Arnie buying Christine and all that stuff happens early, but because we're in Dennis's point of view, we're not seeing all of that happen for the most part. Right. It's just going off on Dennis's life and learning about Dennis around town and Dennis's college prospects and all this stuff that ultimately doesn't mean anything. And I almost wonder if the reason why we change perspectives is because Dennis has the injury and gets laid up in the hospital. I'm wondering if King realized that he kind of stuck himself in that perspective and he couldn't continue telling the story with that. So he's like, quick, let me just wrap up Dennis here real quick. And then we'll go out of his head. And then we'll come back to Dennis near the end. I, I agree. I think he had to have realized, oh, wait, you know, I'm not seeing enough here. I've got to do something to sort of turn it around. Because heaven forbid you actually just go back and rewrite that portion, not from Dennis's point of view. Hmm. Don't be silly. No. <laughs> you can't publish two books a year if you go back and do rewrites. Come on. <laughs> yeah, this is where I have my main problem with King is he writes very great first drafts. It's a shame he never does a second. It seems like they could have knocked this out of the park in just like a skeleton crew kind of short story. Yeah. No, and that's the thing is this story reminds me a lot of there's a short story called Sometimes They Come Back. Oh, yes, that's a good one. Which I know, Angie, you know, because we covered that in the sequels. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love that short story, yes. There's no more story to Christine than what you have in Sometimes They Come Back in terms of just the actual plot and all that stuff. You yeah. don't need any more room to tell Christine than you needed to tell Sometimes They Come Back. And if you do Christine, do you need maximum overdrive? <laughs> well, that kicked it up to a whole worldwide thing. I guess, yeah. yeah. That's the sequel. Planet Christine. That one's much more intentionally silly, too. Yeah. 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 But yeah, there's zero reason why Christine needed to be 500 pages. You did not need the whole subplot involving Will Darnell as the crime lord. The whole Roland LeBay thing, if that's the version that you're more interested in, then yes, you do need room for it. I personally wasn't, so I didn't need any of that. But even so, you could still tell that even if it was novella or something, you know, you don't need yeah. a huge novel to do it. Yeah, I mean, like, at most, Christine should have been just like 130 pages. Yeah. You could get it done in like 40, 50. But if you needed a little more room, that's all you needed. I could have done it in one sentence. Look out for the car! Yeah. <laughs> Oh my God, read it again. Look out. <laughs> That's the thing about the movie is the movie is a very faithful adaptation. It just cuts out all of the meaningless stuff. That's right. kind of why I well, like it. It doesn't always hold together as cleanly, mm -hmm. but I don't mind that. I feel if I had read the book first, I would have preferred that. I feel like with this story, it's sort of so flimsy. I would have preferred whichever one I saw first. Yeah. I, well, I'll say this. Like, you know, when I was doing Castle Rock Companion, I was not going in chronological order with King because I wanted to read the books I wanted to read and that way it would keep me going. Mm -hmm. But I was doing that for probably on a full year. And Christine was the first one that I was like, you know what? I need to put this down. <laughs> and go read any other author. <laughs> and then I'll come back. <laughs> and a lot of that is Dennis. And I agree with yes, you. It's just yes. being stuck in Dennis's head. Mm -hmm. Think about Dennis feels, man. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> Part of it is because he's just a real teen jock. He's not a bad mm -hmm. guy. He's just a teenage boy. And you're stuck dealing with that mentality again. Part of it is just it doesn't have anything to do with the story. Right. It's like all this cool stuff is probably happening with Arnie, but because you're with Dennis, you don't even know about it. Yeah, exactly. You don't see any of it. I mean, like even the whole fight with Buddy Repperton is still from Dennis's point of view. So Having heard about it. No, he's actually there. He is there? Okay. It's just that know. that fight happens a lot later. And, and there's like the earlier fight with Arnie and Buddy in the machine shop that you just hear about second hand. Okay. But yeah, it's just, you don't get to see the immediate after effects of that. It's still a long time before Buddy Reverton just like disappears from the book for a long stretch of time. Just imagine you write a story from the perspective of a character that, oh, I found this car. I really love it. Holy shit. This car seems to be alive. Yeah. 
that's odd. Oh, wait, now why am I getting all these thoughts? You know, like the idea yeah. of like somebody being possessed or like that's such a much more interesting story than. Yeah. So let me tell you about this friend of mine and the weird stuff <laughs> that happened to him. The moment it cut out of Dennis's point of view. It was like a breath of fresh air and oh, the book yeah. became a lot more interesting. And then like in the last 200 pages, then fell into the whole subplot about Will Darnell and his crime thing, which ran for like, that was like a hundred pages of the book in itself wow. it was all of the fallout of that. And I completely forgot about it because that's how yeah. important it was to the story. <laughs> and Arnie is in jail and his mom is like hounding lawyers to get him all. It's just, it goes on and on and on. I think it's one of those cases where King didn't really have an idea of the story he wanted to tell and was just kind of wandering his way into it, which he does sometimes, sometimes to good effects, sometimes not. But it's like, that's where you go back and you do a rewrite to tighten everything up and clean it up. Even the whole bits where it's from Dennis's point of view, he's actually making real-time references to he's writing down this manuscript like four years later. Mm -hmm. And he has like gathered all these thoughts. He's finally putting down the story to paper and it's like all this stuff going on. But that doesn't explain what that middle chunk of the book is that we're reading. And yet he's making back references to, but you read about that earlier in the book. It's like, wait, when did you write that mm -hmm. from the point of view of someone who died? Where did that chunk of the book come from? Because he's trying to have his cake and eat it too, of like the dentist portions of the book are a real manuscript that are being prepared. The middle portion is just a novel. Yeah. But yet the manuscript is making references to those portions. It's like, what? wait, what? Maybe he got Arnie to dictate it before he died. And this is seriously where Stephen needed to sit down and rewrite that first chunk. There is literally zero excuse other than he just didn't want to do it. <laughs> and that's actually my main problem with Stephen King is that I think he is a great writer. I think he tells really strong stories. But he has zero sense of self-editing, and he's one of those ones where it's like, once he kind of like gets a story out, he's like, that's done, and he never really goes back to it, except usually with like stand where it's like, let's make it bigger. <laughs> well, is that really his problem or his editors? A little of both. Well, yeah, and then that's the thing is he got to the point where he became famous enough where nobody would edit him anymore. Yeah. And then also because he had those periods in the 70s where they did edit him, and he kind of resented them for it, like with the stand. Yeah. And I know Salem's Lot had chunks that were cut out that he was really pissed off at. And he just doesn't like people saying, you got to cut this and you got to cut that. Well, I guess in his defense, he is making a lot of money. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like he's one of those people, you can criticize him all you want. He's still going to be one of the most best-selling authors. Right. Of and I mean, yeah. sometimes, even though he is kind of meandering toward a point, usually, for me at least, that stuff is enjoyable enough that I don't mind so much. I like the characters. Oh, yeah. I like that kind of slice-of-life stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'm willing to go with it. But with Christine... Uh... Even the dentist stuff was well-written. I just didn't care about it. <laughs> he's a whiz for dialogue. I like hearing, like, yes. two old guys talking on the porch. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's like any time that Dennis calls up someone while he's tracking down George LeBay, he'll have like a three-page conversation with them where you find out who this guy <laughs> is, his life story, his views on politics, all this stuff. Just a character that only appears once in the novel yep. just so Dennis can get an address. <laughs> Which, again, is not bad, but it's like, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be honest, of all the Stephen King books I read, this was definitely one of the weaker ones, just in terms of it was so frustrating. Yeah. I never even read it, yeah. I've read a good handful of his works, nowhere near as much as you, Angie, but I <laughs> think I was only just like two or three books away from this in my read-through of King, so I've read everything leading up to it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah, this and The Stand are probably the only frustrating ones for me, and even The Stand is still kind of amazing at times. I love every second of The Stand. The <laughs> Stand is great. <laughs> the story falls apart for me in the second half, but it still has great stuff in it. Mm -hmm. Hey guys, you know what a fact is? I got a fact for you. What's the fact? Part of being a parent is trying to kill your kids. <laughs> yeah, what's up with that line, huh? It doesn't make a lick of sense. <laughs> and he says it so deeply. Which is weird because so much of the book is him trying to kill his parents. Exactly. He's the murderer. He's just like, buddy, you know what, man? With our generation, parents are trying to kill us. You're like, no, they're not. Fuck you and your pot roast. <laughs> I guess that's a very teenage perspective. Very much so. But it also does not fit in the theme of the book, which is basically, no. I love my car. Yeah. Have you met my car? <laughs> I want to marry my she's car. <laughs> pretty great. <laughs> And that's actually the thing about writing in the head of Dennis that I do applaud King for is because he's a guy pushing 40. He was more like Arnie. He was kind of the bookish nerdy kid. And he's trying to write in the first person mindset of a character who was not him. He never had that teenage life. No. Nope. So I applaud King for that experiment in terms of putting yourself in the head of another character. I still did not enjoy it. No. 
If jocks really are that pigheadish, I'm glad I didn't really become friends with any of them in high school because I would have hated them. <laughs> <laughs> Even not being a jock, I was kind of pigheaded. Teenage boys kind of sucks. <laughs> yeah, we all do. <laughs> all of us. Every single one of us. And then the thing about the parents killing their kids and, and a lot of the book about him killing their parents, there's even this whole bit where Dennis is like calling up Arnie's dad because him and Arnie's dad actually kind of forged this bond over the concern for their son and getting Arnie's dad to like round up all of Lee's parents and all of Dennis's parents so that while they're trying to kill Christine, she's not trying to kill the parents. They can all get together in this one place that's kind of up on a hill in a concrete structure. Of course, we find out that that maybe didn't work because when Christine shows up for the big final conflict, she's got Arnie's dead dad sitting in the driver's seat and basically just tosses him out on the ground. Hmm. How did she do that? <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> don't, don't ask how. Okay. <laughs> Actually, they do explain it. It's basically how Will Darnell died. She just uh, appeared and Michael decided, hey, I'm going to climb behind the front seat, despite the fact that he's gotten all these warnings. I think Don't we meant just the logistics the of getting him out of the car. Yeah. yeah. How, how did she push him? How did yeah. she push him? She does not have an ejector seat. No, she no. did like that Tokyo Drift thing where it's like you just come in squealing to a stop, open the door, and he flies out. Okay, so yeah, you're now talking about a better movie like I want to see, Christine Tokyo Drift. <laughs> The way Arnie gets thrown out of the car is very much how Michael got thrown out of the car. It was just, he was just a floppy corpse. Yeah. And then, of course, the car is still full of, like, the grinning zombie Roland LeBay. Mm. You get, like, the grinning corpses of, like, the Artie Lang guy and Buddy Repperton and all these people are just sitting in the back seat howling with laughter as Roland LeBay is trying to run everyone down. It gets way too tales from the crypty. It does. <laughs> Where the whole thing is essentially a PSA for wearing your seatbelt. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I like the movie, because it strips all that away and it just, no, the car is just trying to kill you. It just focuses on the story of Arnie and Dennis. It doesn't always tell it cleanly. Mm -hmm. I actually have less plotting problems with this than I do Halloween. And hmm. I love Halloween. I had a couple of problems with Halloween. I know you did. Oh, yes, you did. I know. Yeah. I was very much with you, Julie. Thank you. <laughs> I have a lot of problems with Halloween. Myself. None of which I begrudge you for. I have more problems with Halloween. You've opened up my eyes. Remember, remember, remember a minute ago when Noel said floppy corpse? <laughs> <laughs> no, I will be honest. In, in many, in many. Floppy corpse. <laughs> <laughs> That's also a good title for this movie. I also like the title Obsession for Car. <laughs> <laughs> I will be honest, in many ways, I actually think I've liked this movie more than I do Halloween overall. Interesting, a bold statement. <laughs> I will come out and I will say that now. I sincerely love this movie. I think it's one of the stronger ones we've covered before. It's still not pushing away any of our top ones in terms of like Thing, Precinct 13, mm. someone's watching me, but I liked it more than I did Escape from New York. I Yeah, I, I'm going to put it above Halloween for me. Which surprises me. I won't get outraged. I'm just below recommending. This is a film I've always looked back fondly, but man, Halloween was a very much awakening experience discussing it with you guys. Mm -hmm. And while I still love the movie, it did not affect me as much as it used to. And this one still does. And I don't know. It's, I think maybe it's time to kind of wrap things up with some final thoughts. And my final mm -hmm. thought is I still really like this movie. I think it's a perfect hybrid of King's story and Carpenter's style. It doesn't all make sense. Lee is still a weak character, and some of the acting still goes a little too much. But it really is an effective movie. It really pulls me into the story. It really is chilling, and just, I really like how it's made. For me, I'm so right down the middle of the line. It was not an unenjoyable film to watch. There was a lot I liked, a lot I didn't like. Didn't really work for me as a film, so I really am straight down the middle. I do feel like it did a really good job of trimming a lot of the fat from the novel. I feel like they may have cut a little too much at parts, but I really like the action a lot. I love Christine and her, you know, all of her moments. So there are parts, it's like, I want to like this film, but ultimately I just, it's not going to be in one of my favorites, you know? Mm hmm well, I mean, I, I said I gave it a soft yes. I'm going to change that to a floppy yes. <laughs> <laughs> Patent pending. <laughs> it just kind of spills over. And yeah, I mean, I had like a lot of problems with it. As I said, I got a lot of problems with a lot of things. <laughs> so this being one of them, not a surprise. 
But in the end, I give it a B plus. Like, I liked it. A for effort? I liked it. A for effort. It was so <laughs> ridiculous at some points. That's when I started to enjoy I appreciated it that aspect. When they're yeah. fighting a car with a bulldozer, I'm like, yes, you're <laughs> yes. speaking my language. Now movie. we're talking. This is what I want. I make a note of the fact that, like, 45-year-old men are beating up other 45-year-old men for their lunch. But I also really <laughs> like that. You're a really hungry 45-year-old man. <laughs> I love how much they really draw out just him driving up over Christine. Oh, yeah, that was great. Uh, And then the instant cut to Christine being crunched into a box in the junkyard. Yeah, that was great. (laughs) Bad to the bone. (laughs) Opening and closing with that song. Yep. Bad to the chassis. (laughs) (laughs) That was my car joke. And whenever someone. (laughs) I'll test drive that one. <laughs> and when anyone's trying to get into Christine, I hear you knocking, but you can't yep. come in. <laughs> and we should also mention in the book, Christine fully comes back at the end, too. Oh, really? I would assume so. It was just a matter of time, no? Like, yeah. yeah. She's coming back. Yeah. yeah. They do the whole car crusher turning into her little cube. But then it's like a few years later, Dennis is finishing up the manuscript. And he's like, and I have to put in one final note. I just saw a news story about the one last member of Buddy Repperton's gang who fled to California, was working at a drive-in movie theater, and a car just ran him over. <laughs> what does this mean? <laughs> I think we know what it Coincidence? means. Coincidence? Yeah. <laughs> the end? Question mark? So I think that brings us to a close. Mm-hmm. Alex and Julia, thank you as always. No problem. You're welcome. <laughs> Angie, thank you very much for joining us on this episode. Oh, thank you for having me. It was fun. Thank you for coming, Angie. I liked you being here and talking to your voice. <laughs> <laughs> we do have her lined up for more down the road, so that'll be fun. You're welcome yes. back anytime, Angie. You've been fantastic. Yay. And I think next one what we're going to be doing is Starman. I have not seen it, so I have no comments. Jeff Bridges from Space. And now I have David Bowie in my head. <laughs> <laughs> that would be incredible. <laughs> Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. <laughs>